Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm Larry Williams, the director of Karma, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, uh, now hosted in the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. Uh, it is October 5th. Uh, 2022, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to another uh, version of our Karma Quick Chat, uh, in which we take the opportunity to have a, a relatively short, informal conversation with various people who are contributing to Karma. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to have joining us Jason Wong from Michigan State University. Jason uh, will be giving a Karma webcast October 28th on uh, around one of his areas of interest, insufficient effort responding. And uh, so we're very excited. Jason, Jason, thanks for taking the time to hang out here with us a bit. Uh, let me add that it's an extra special treat to be chatting with Jason because uh, we were colleagues uh, back at Wayne State University uh, right when he came out of his doctoral program and we had a lot of fun and like to think we did a lot of good while we were there. So uh, Jason, it's good to be with you again. So uh, we're particularly excited because Jason um, is in, just been elected to the leadership track of the research methods division. So when that's a five-year track, you may know. So he'll be the chairperson in a few years. And uh, so everything seems to be going great, Jason. So we're very excited to be, to be catching up with you. So, um, you know, I like talking to people, Jason, about just how they coped with the pandemic, you know, and so clearly you stay productive. How did you manage all of that? Uh, that that's a good question. Uh, I, I would like to say I stay productive, but in retrospect, that might not be, be true, right? Because having two little kids at home, one, yeah. is one was in kindergarten, the other was in second grade. It was uh, it was hectic, right? And and I focused on the essential things like revisions and and things like that. But um, it, it made me realize well how different it is when when prior to the pandemic, I really enjoyed working at home because I could have uninterrupted time for mm -hmm. for writing. But during the pandemic, it kind of changed. It made me realize I, I was almost like a test subject for a test switching environment, test switching experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Every five minutes or so, one of them would come over and ask me a, a little thing like that and just constant interruption. But, uh, but fortunately, I, I, I survived. I, um, I learned how to rollerblade during the pandemic with the kids. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and right now, um, really feeling energized to, to um, focus on a lot of the different things that I feel excited about. Yeah. So do you find that after the pandemic, having been isolated, that you've been a little bit more interested in being on campus? Um, there, there are there are in person activities that um, we we would like to to um, restart or getting students back interested in. Um, um, I, I go to campus two to three days a week, um, mm -hmm. and the remaining days I work from home. But I'm mm -hmm. pretty pretty much accessible by by email by um, phone call when necessary. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I find it a good mix to to stay focused for at least a couple of days a week. Yeah, yeah. Well, I found that after after all the time at home, uh, I learned to work better at home. But I was really eager to get in and uh, have the social aspect of it as well. So, how did you end up uh, go pursuing a career? You're a Michigan State I/O alum. How did you end up in going to graduate school in I/O and pursuing an academic career? Uh, that that's a that that's a great question. I um, so part of it is I I guess interest is always there, but uh, to to start. Um, my my career, I I didn't imagine myself become becoming an academic, right? Um, after graduating from from college, I was a human resource co uh, training coordinator for a couple of years, and while working in the industry, I realized well, if I could be a a trainer or 
um, come te teach in the in the corporate environment, I could make big bucks. And that's what triggered or what motivated me to to apply to graduate school. But once going to graduate school, learning that how interesting or exciting some of the research ideas are and and the the academic freedom to pursue the research ideas that really led me right into the the desire to pursue an academic career yeah well you know uh, jason one of the things that i'm always interested in in the in the people who of whom i know their methods work uh, is that nearly everybody also has some substantive interest, and it's that kind of combination of methods and substance that is the, the basis of their career. What are some of the substantive areas that you work in? So I, I can broadly classify my substantive interest in, in two areas. The first area is personality change and adaptive performance. So um, I've always been interested in personality, and uh, one well, the predominant approach is still the, the trait approach. We look at how, um, uh, we look at people's typical patterns of behavior across a wide variety of situations, right? And, and we um, typically we assign people a number on a trait dimension and we use that to understand behavior and to, to predict behaviors at work. So along that line, I've studied how personality traits enable people to be selected into into a certain work environment and how people modify and and adapt to their working environment because of their personality traits and how personality traits evoke responses from other people so that's one area that i that i tend to look at personality but what gets me more excited or um really excited about personality is the dynamic aspect because we know even with two individuals at the same trait level, they may respond to situations in different ways. So mm -hmm. there are situational cues or triggers that lead them to behave very differently. And one example is task contingent conscientiousness. So we can think about some people being better able or capable to adapt to more challenging tasks by working harder, more systematically and things like that. Other people may not do so. Uh, and that's something we can capture um, to better understand and make prediction about behavior. So that's how it leads to, um, uh, how it can lead to adaptive performance. And, and more recently, I'm also interested in, in changes in personality and, and for example, um, one's work family experience may relate to changes mm -hmm. in personality. So that, that's one, one area. And the second area is training and transfer. But I, I really think about it as an adaptability issue. So how individuals acquire new knowledge and skills um, and apply it back to the workplace. So organizations spend a ton of money on training efforts, but they mm -hmm. haven't really seen the, the end of it in, in um, how, how it impacts bottom line in, adapt, uh, in, in uh, transfer. So I'm studying the the end of what happens after the training. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Jason, um, your success with your substantive pursuits, as well as, you, as your methodological suit pursuits, have uh, led you not only to be elected into the research into the leadership track of the research methods division, but also a relatively new appointment as an associate editor at the Journal of Management. And so I'm just kind of curious, you know, now that you're into it, what's your initial reactions? How is it different than what you thought it would be? What's it been like? Well, yeah, I can't believe it's been two years already. In, in, uh, I'm, I'm on my third year term as associate editor at Journal of Management. Um, it's been a very interesting learning, learning experience. So um, when, when, when I served as re reviewer before, right, I would review an article because it's really related to my area of interest. As an associate editor, the alignment is not as close, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, I would say I, I will have some familiarity with the literature, but not as close 
as I would as a as a reviewer. So that that involves a bit of learning on my part. And and fortunately, at Journal of Management, we have great um, reviewers, editorial board members, and and I I can rely on them. But one thing that I also realized um, pretty soon after I stepped into this role is there is a bit of an ownership as, as an associate editor um, for a paper that's interesting or, or I can see the contribution it can make to the mm -hmm. literature. Um, I, 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 I kind of, I, I would take on the, the ownership a little bit and, and will hope that the authors can respond to the comments so that uh, the paper will end up being published at Journal of Management. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I often say of all the things that I've done in my career that, that the editorial, being in an editorial position is one of the most uh, stimulating. There's nothing better than sitting down with a set of reviews uh, on a paper and, and kind of helping the authors craft a vision that takes into account uh, their feedback and that you you have hopes that it'll end up being uh, published. Of course, you know, there's a lot of bad papers that you have to work your way through as well. But when you get a good paper and you can really do that, um, that that's a great experience. Um, so um, as I mentioned, you're with us because you're going to be given a webcast in a couple of weeks. Before you preview the webcast, let me just say for, for those that don't know, uh, the topic is the general area of insufficient effort responding. So tell us about how you got interested in that. Um, that kind of relates back to my interest in, in personality, right? So uh, an interesting anecdote, uh, when I started my, my first year at Michigan State in the doctoral program, um, one of the professors, um, Rick Deshaun, will hold this weekly meeting um, on, on measurement issues. And we will read the, the, um, the good old articles on measurement. We, we even uh, looked at um, compare psychological measurement to, to physical measurement. Um, so there, there are these grand topics that we, that we thought about. And then gradually we, re we realized what's the one thing we could do to improve our measurement. And that came down to, for, for all of us there to, well, Kel is responding to, to surveys that we administer, right? Mm -hmm. So some students just don't, don't pay attention to the surveys and, and they just, um, they will fly through the survey. So what could we do about it? So that eventually became um, this methodological area of interest of mine. I, I've spent um, many years on this topic, but, and, and, I, and along the way there, there were interesting, interesting findings. And I, I, I can still remember uh, the, the times that I talked to Larry about about some of my findings, and I, I, I was pretty excited back then, and I'm still excited about some of the some of the ideas, some some of the findings that that we we found pretty recently. Yep, yeah, there was a great overlap in uh, your interest in uh, careless responding, and my interest more generally in in method variance. So, so uh, can you give us some details about what you're going to be talking about? So um, just as an overview, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the impact of having insufficient effort responding in the data, in survey data, and what kind of impact it'll have in, in the results that we observe. And then I'll, I'll talk about the common approaches to detecting insufficient effort responding in surveys. And, and I'll, I'll pay attention to the practical constraints that users may have when, when they design their own survey. Yeah. Well, uh, for those who don't know, this uh, Jason's webcast will be offered as part of our um, Karma Institutional Membership Program. We do 10 live webcasts a year, and we place their recordings into our video library. Uh, we were celebrating our 25th year, so we have well over 250 recordings that are in there, I think. And you can find more information uh, on the Karma website. Uh, we have roughly 150 schools worldwide that, that join. So 
If your school is not a member, and you can find that out on the Karma website, um, we have some sample stuff that's available that you can take a look at. So again, Jason Wong will be with us in uh, on October 28th talking about insufficient effort responding. Jason, it was great to get caught up with you. Uh, congratulations on all your success, and we'll look forward to your webcast in a few weeks. Thanks, Larry. I look forward to seeing everyone on the webcast. All right. Thank you.